Thanks for checking out this online resource. We here at Calvary Community Church hope it's a help to you in your own spiritual journey. But online resources can't replace our engagement with the local church, where we can serve with others, we can worship with others, we can do life together and reach out to the community. If you live near Calvary, we invite you to join us 6 p.m. Saturday or 9 or 11 Sunday morning for one of our weekend services. If you live at a distance, just email us at info at calvarycc.org and we'll help you find a church where you can get grounded and growing in Christ. We gave you an update a few weeks ago on our Friday Night Lights ministry to high school students in our area after the football games. Uh, we have an opportunity for students to come in high school, come into our high school ministry space we've had just for a few years in the outdoor space there, have fun, free tacos, free cotton candy, games to play, music, and uh, just sort of a place to come and hang out afterwards. And we talked about how we don't do that after every game, but we do this several times in the fall, and we're doing it four times. Maybe there'll be a fifth if there's a playoff game. But four times we've had two of those. The first one I told you had 888 high school students come from 9 o'clock to 12 o'clock. 888. The second one was not this last Friday, but the Friday before, and we had 1,291 high school students showed up. And uh, as a matter of fact, it's, it's grown so that they're going to adjust how they have things organized in the room and try to create even some more space in that area. And so um, it's a great thing. We have about 15 to 20 high schools represented each time we do this. And they've got two more coming. And one's coming up, the homecoming game at Oaks. They're playing Newberry Park. And then there's a game coming against Westlake Village High School, Westlake High School. And so though, when, they, when a game is here on our campus, it not only involves Oaks, but one of the other main schools that our, our students go to in our ministry here, it really can be a big deal. So let's pray that God uses those Friday Night Lights opportunities. Also, throughout the summer, we mentioned to you on a couple of occasions that we have a new Hispanic ministry that's begun. We've kind of had a soft launch for that in the last several months with our new pastor of Hispanic ministries, Frank Garcia, introduced him to you uh, back in June. And Tuesday night, they had their official kickoff launch, uh, and it, it got started with a really good group of 81 individuals who came out for dinner and who came for worship in Spanish. So that's a great start. It's a part of our engaging 20% of the greater Conejo Valley for Christ. Some in this room right now are listening to me who Spanish is their primary language and they're not listening to me and what I'm saying in this room, but they're actually listening to a receiver with a little uh, headphone that they can listen to. And Pastor Frank is over in a room over here and I like to talk very fast because it makes it harder on him. But um, he is actually right now translated me in real, translating me in real time and so there are some friends in the room who, again, Spanish is their primary language, but they're listening in Spanish while I'm speaking. And if you're interested in that, just go to the counter. This only happens during the 11 o'clock service each weekend, but go to the counter. If you have a friend, a relative, a neighbor, somebody you'd like to bring with you, but it's hard for them to understand what I'm saying, tell them you have a hard time too, uh, but that the, the service can be provided for them in Spanish during this hour. Also, they have a Tuesday night Bible study that's getting going, and so you can invite them to that. You can uh, call our office, go online, check out this, uh, this brand new Hispanic ministry that we believe God is going to use for his glory in the days ahead. Now, when I uh, was in seminary, uh, Leslie and I had just gotten married. We'd completed college. She already uh, was, had her training to be a teacher, and so she started teaching uh, and she went, went and taught full-time, and that helped us get through seminary without uh, uh, debt of any kind. And we, we were living in the Baltimore, Washington area, near actually where Leslie uh, grew up. And I attended Capital Bible Seminary. I went toward D.C. every day. She went toward the Baltimore area, and she taught in a private Christian school there. And the church had a requirement that if you taught in their school, then you had to attend their church. And so we didn't have much of a choice. So in those days, those couple of years in seminary, while I was working on my master's, uh, we attended uh, that church. Now, that church did not like the seminary I was going to, and uh, so they didn't trust me to teach anyone over the age of three in the church. <laughs> and they made that very clear to me pretty early. And so Leslie and I, our ministry uh, for those years was we taught the two- and three-year-olds class during church, the toddler church. 
And that was a great experience. If you can teach the gospel and talk about Jesus with little kids, you can translate that to adults. So I used the same principles then, or now that I used then, just so you know. <laughs> and in, in, in our time in there, a lot of the songs I sang as a little kid in a church in northern Indiana, in Mishawaka, my hometown, Twin Branch Bible Church, a lot of those songs we were singing with those kids. And one of those songs that the kids love to sing is one I love to sing. And I remember what room I was in at Twin Branch Bible Church. I remember it was Juanita Schmidt. I don't know if she was the first one to teach it to me, but I remember very vividly at about uh, three or four years of age singing this song with Mrs. Schmidt up front leading us. And the song was, uh, the wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. The wise man built his house upon the rock. No, 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 I did that wrong. I got it right in the nine. You should watch that one. <laughs> then it says, the rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the rock stood firm. And then, uh, of course, the second part of the song is, uh, the foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. The foolish man built his house upon the sand. And the rains came a tumbling down. That's the part I forgot in the first one. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. The rains came down and the floods came up. And the house on the sand went splat. Now those two or three year olds, they wanted to sing the splat part. <laughs> they would sing, let's sing splat. I mean, you really wanted them to hear the part about standing firm, right? But, and the house on the rock stood firm, just wasn't as appealing as the house on the sand went splat. But that little song is repeating almost word for word, the words of Jesus in one of the parables that he tells to his disciples in a crowd that gathers. If you want to open your Bibles to Matthew chapter 7, I want us to look at the parable of the wise and foolish builders. We're entering into a new teaching series. Uh, this series is a six-part series. It begins today with our look in Matthew chapter 7. You can go there in your paper Bible or on your mobile device, Matthew chapter 7. This is the first message of six in a series called The Dangers of Blessings. And it's going to look through these weeks at success and comfort and health and wealth and prosperity and influence and affluence and, and uh, privilege and opportunity. And we're going to look at all these different things that can be blessings and see how these blessings can easily, if we misuse them or approach them in the wrong way, can actually become dangers in our lives. And we're going to be looking at six different parables that Jesus tells. A parable was a, a simple story that was easy for the folks who heard it to relate to, but taught a deep, profound truth. We're going to look at six different parables over the next six weeks. And we're going to explore what the dangers of blessings really is all about. As we do this, I want you to know that this is a church-wide teaching series. So right now, while we're in this room, in early childhood, in middle school, and in high school and elementary, they are teaching this exact same lesson to your children and grandchildren. We've been planning this series, this fall series, since February, and we've had creative team members and content member team members who worked very hard to put this together. Now, at the early childhood level, they're not talking about the dangers of blessing in the zero to four-year-olds, but they're talking about how every good gift comes from God, and God is the God of blessings. And then at each age-appropriate level, they're communicating uh, the, the importance of these six parables and this theme around blessings. And for those in the upper age levels and for us as adults, we're looking at the dangers of blessings. This was kicked off Thursday night at our young adults worship service. And uh, they started as our uh, young adults pastor, Brian Williams, uh, spoke on this exact same parable. So we're, we're in alignment and our small groups are all aligned uh, together on this from middle school, high school, uh, into our young adults and to the general population of the church. And our team has put together this book that you were given at the door. We have one for every person, uh, in attendance today. If you didn't get this on your way in, there are copies of this book, the dangers of blessings on the carts in the entrance ways there on the Bible carts. And uh, this book covers all six of these weeks that we're going to be looking into these six parables. 
The book has in there even discussion guide questions for small groups. Uh, you can use them as families. It has the take notes. Our devotionals are in here that you can use to prepare for each week. And it also has some quotes and some other activities. There are, there are blank pages for taking notes. Somebody last night said, oh, you know, now that they're not handing the take note out uh, for your teachings, it was really hard for us to get everything that came on the screen into these blank pages. And I said, oh, no, the take notes are still there. And they said, well, why don't you put them in here? And I said, I don't work as well as our team that far in advance. So these blank pages are just to write down things you're catching as I'm teaching. But the take note, the outline that has the blanks in it, is still available at the Bible carts on your way in so you can follow along with the message. And this, this book, is a, it's a great looking book. We've got some wonderful creative folks who worked on this. And uh, it's also a tool, this whole series, including this book, I hope will be a tool for you as parents. I know as a parent, there were times it seemed like a lot of our parenting, when we're talking about values and spiritual things, a lot of times the parenting happens in confrontational moments when our kids have disobeyed or they've done something wrong and we want to teach them important things. But it's very important, according to Deuteronomy chapter 6, that we look for opportunities to teach our children to, to speak into their lives spiritually, to come alongside, to grow with them and let them see us grow in non-confrontational moments of our parenting. And so we hope that, because, that with your children in early childhood, elementary, middle school, high school, even your young adults, that when you're leaving here uh, to go home this afternoon, you talk about the parable of the rich and, uh, or the, excuse me, the wise and foolish builders. You, you, you talk about the things we're talking about here, and you can have a discussion as parents. You see, we here at Calvary believe you are the primary spiritual influencer or discipler of your children, not us. Some of you may come here thinking, oh, but I just turn them over to you. Well, we're here to support what they're getting at home, not to supplant what they're getting at home. So we would encourage you to look for opportunities to speak into your kids' lives spiritually. And this series gives you that opportunity to have conversations on the way home through the week. Look at this book. Find some things that will help you with your children and your students as we move forward over the next uh, six weeks together. Let's look at Matthew chapter 7. Verses 24 through 29 as we look at the wise and foolish builders. Therefore, everyone who hears these words of mine. I want to stop right there. You can underline the word mine. In the position and in the, the case it's in, this word in the Greek is emphatic. So it's emphatic twice. Jesus says, these words of mine. Everyone who hears these words that I just spoke. Now, what did he just speak about? You go back to Matthew 5, 6, and now into chapter 7 of Matthew's gospel, and you have the Sermon on the Mount, where Jesus explains the Old Testament in practical terms for us today. And he teaches it very differently than the, the religious leaders of the day. And he wants them to understand, these are my words. And if you have heard these words, then you need to understand this. Everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, does them, obeys them, is like a wise man who built his house on the rock. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against the house, yet it did not fall because it had its foundation on the rock. But everyone who hears these words of mine and does not put them into practice is like a foolish man who built his house on sand. The rain came down, the streams rose, and the winds blew and beat against that house, and it fell with a great crash. Splat. <laughs> Verse 28, when Jesus had finished saying these things, the crowds were amazed. The word amazed shows up many times in the four gospels that record the life and ministry of Jesus. But this word, amazed, is in the original Greek only used here. The other words for amazed is kind of like they are amazed and overjoyed and, and they keep moving forward and it just adds to their journey. This word for amazed, we would say it, say it this way, they were stopped in their tracks. Their jaw, their jaws dropped. And what, what, are they, what are they stunned by? What is it that has grabbed their attention? The crowds were amazed at his teaching because Jesus taught as one who had authority they clearly saw his divinity coming out and he, how he communicated with authority, not as the teachers of the law, who often just quoted others who had added all kinds of things and misinterpreted the Old Testament. So he speaks with authority. 
And notice in this parable, he, he draws this story of the two builders. One who builds wisely on the rock when the storms and the rain come. It stands one who builds on the sand. And so when the storms come, the winds blow, it collapses. I want us to think of this today as we look at this wonderful parable together. Walking in obedience to Christ today ensures your real success when the storms of life come tomorrow. You want to be ready for what you don't even know is coming? Then today, walk in relationship to Jesus Christ. Walk in obedience to the words of Christ, not only in the Sermon on the Mount, but throughout the scriptures. And then your life will be prepared to withstand the storms that are coming. I love to stay in the lobby after services and I try to stay there until there's nobody else who wants to talk to me. And I pray with folks and folks will give me updates if they're going to move. And I say, come back and pray with me in a couple weeks before you leave and just have just great conversations. And um, as I am standing there in the lobby and someone will come up and say, we just, we just had a death in our family or, or uh, my husband was diagnosed with cancer this week or this financial crisis or this job loss. And they'll, they'll share things with me they want me to pray about. Often I'll say, well, you know, have you, been, have you been walking with the Lord and in his word and prayer? Are you hanging out with God's people? Are you faithful to church services where you can grow and be challenged? Oh, no, we just, life's been too busy. We just haven't had a lot of time for God in the last few months or years. Or, yeah, we check in every now and then, but not really. But they want me in those moments to make it all right in their lives so they're strong enough to withstand. And God bless you. I'll pray with you if, if that's the case and I'm willing to pray and help people in any way I can. But let me tell you what Jesus is teaching in this parable is what you're doing now in how you live your life and on what you are building your life determines how you're going to stand when the storms come. Verse 24, everyone who hears these words of mine and puts them into practice, does them, follows through in obedience, is like a wise man who built his house on his rock, on a rock. Now, this concept of obedience can sound like some sort of dictatorial legalism. No, he's saying these words I'm sharing with you with this authority because these are the words you're going to need for life. And, and he would tell his disciples, if you love me, keep my commandments. Walk in obedience. Because I know what is best for you. James would say it in James 1.22 this way, but be doers of the word and not hearers only. Jesus would say to the disciples in the upper room the night before he was placed on the cross, John 13.17, now that you know these things, you'll be blessed if you do them. There are people who look at the Sermon on the Mount, the teachings of Christ, the things of the Word of God, and say, yeah, I agree with that. I like that. That's good stuff. But then they walk away, and they don't put it into practice. There are people who come into church week after week, and they'll walk out and say, oh, that was a good sermon, and boy, I was challenged. And, but are you putting it into practice? Are, are, are you walking in obedience? Each of these weeks, as we look at these parables that help us understand the dangers of blessings, we're going to see a warning each week. Jesus has a warning in each of these parables. And the warning for this parable is this. Don't build your life on any foundation other than obedience to Jesus Christ. All other, all other ground is sinking sand. Don't build your life on any other foundation than a relationship of obedience to Jesus Christ. Now, have you ever been in a building? I was in, when my son had an accident last year, we were in the hospital quite a bit, and a few times the alarm went off. Have you ever been in a building where the alarm goes off in a store or somewhere you're not familiar, and people are kind of standing around, and you hear it, you know, fire, fire, leave the building immediately, and lights are flashing, and sirens are going off, and people are looking at each other, well, should we leave? Should we? That happened a few times while we were at the hospital, and the, the uh, f folks who worked there would say, hey, we've already heard from the, the uh, uh, the facilities team that this is a false alarm and you know it, it can kind of lull you if you're not careful. I mentioned that uh, Leslie and I after we got married lived in the Baltimore area and lived near her parents. We lived so close to her parents we lived in the same house with them. <laughs> and it was our way of being able to get through seminary after a couple of years without uh, having a lot of debt and and my, my in-laws always have had over the years like five or six cars and two or three only work at the same time. And my father-in-law takes pride in the fact he's never spent more than like $1,000 for a car and that the majority of his cars he's paid less than $100 for them. And he takes great pride in that. 
But the problem is, you never know which of his cars are working at the time that you can drive or not. And, and I got into one of the cars, and he said, yeah, this one, will, this one will get you to seminary and back today. And, you know, out on the Baltimore-Washington Parkway or on the Beltway around D.C., you want to make sure your car is going to get you somewhere. And I was driving that first day in one of his cars, and I started seeing these little lights kind of glowing from the dashboard. But I couldn't, they weren't really distinct, and I couldn't see what they were saying. And I realized there was duct tape over these little warning lights, these little idiot lights, you know, on the dashboard. And so I, I said to him, hey, you know, maybe whoever had this car before you or whatever put these, these pieces of duct tape over those things and, you know, it says check engine, you know, oil change needed. All these things are popping up. And he said, just ignore those. I'm the one who put the duct tape on them. <laughs> I know, it's okay. Don't believe those warnings. Again, you can kind of get lulled in to just taking a warning in stride, but we need to take the warnings of Jesus very seriously. We need to take this warning about building our lives on anything other than an obedient relationship to Jesus Christ very seriously. Let me share with you eight observations of this little parable. Number one, we're all building our lives on something. We're all building our lives on something. You're either building your life on Christ and walking in obedience to his words or you're building your life on the idea of Christianity, the idea of a certain theology, or in your career, sometimes even in your family, or, or your things you own, your house, your car. We're all building our lives on something, our reputation, our looks, all kinds of things that we can easily focus and build our lives on. And they're not always bad things. And yet we spend so much time pursuing that stuff to the neglect of walking with Jesus and walking in obedience to what he says. A longshoreman philosopher Eric Hoffer said, many people in the first half of their lives spend their health looking for wealth and in the second half of their lives spend their wealth looking for health. Isn't that true? So you can get caught up in pursuits when you're young and say, well, someday I'll get serious about God. And then you can say, oh, I'm older now. And you know, it's, I, should, I should have done that years ago. And it's just not a focus for me today. You're building your life on something. Your career, maybe even just the American dream, your family, your stuff, even the idea of Christ's teachings. But obedience to Christ is the true foundation. And Jesus is the very cornerstone, the foundation of that foundation. Can I give you a little bit further on this, a thought regarding when we build our lives on something else. When we build our lives on something else, we actually make that thing the ultimate thing in our lives, and it becomes an idol. And many of you would say, well, I would never carve out of wood or stone or make out of metal some image of a bird or an animal or, or another human being that I would bow down to and worship like primitive cultures. I, I don't, you can't have idols today, like the primitive island people of yesterday. no. You can have idols today. It's anything in your life that takes the ultimate position that Christ should be in. Where you make other things the foundation of your life other than Jesus and walking in obedience to him. Let me challenge you to talk to your spouse, talk to your kids. Talk in your small group this week. I know this will be a part of the discussion this week based on that book and, and the stuff we've prepared. Talk in your small group this week about what kinds of things can become an idol. Look at those people and say, do you see anything more important in my life than Jesus Christ and my submitting to his lordship and walking in obedience to him? Do you see anything else? And some of you say, I don't want to do that because I'm afraid of the answer. Then you really ought to do that. Ask a friend, a Christian friend. Ask your small group. Ask your spouse. Ask your kids. And then for some of you, you might say, boy, I really need to be ready for the storms that have come because the storms that have come in my life so far I've been able to handle. The very starting point to this is to understand that Christ is the foundation. Paul would say to the Corinthian church in 1 Corinthians 3.11, for no one can lay any foundation other than the one already laid, which is Jesus Christ. He would say to the Ephesian church that Jesus is the cornerstone. He is the foundation of the foundation. Now, how did he become that? Well, as God the Son, he left heaven's glory, walked among us, lived a perfect, sinless life, went to the cross, and there he took upon him your sin and mine, 
took that punishment, he was buried, he was raised to new life, so that we today, not by our good works or our attempts to be good enough in any way, but through Jesus and Jesus alone can be forgiven by God and have a relationship with him forever as we put our faith in Christ and Christ alone. And when you do that, then you are anchored in the one who is the foundation of the foundation, and now you can live a life where walking in obedience to him is the foundation of your life. But you have to know Jesus as Savior before you can really submit to him as Lord. If you haven't put your faith in Jesus, that's the starting point. Do so today. As I mentioned, I'm in the lobby after the service. If you have questions, ask me those questions. Let me pray with you to receive Christ today. Our care and prayer team are down front after every service to pray with you, help you in any way. They'd, they'd love to pray with you so that you can know today you've put your faith in the one who is the foundation of the foundation, the cornerstone, Jesus. We're all building our lives on something. We ought to be building our lives on Jesus Christ and a walk of obedience to him. Secondly, what we're building can look very similar to what others are building. I love how Jesus tells this story. He just talks about the wise man building his house and the foolish man building his house. He doesn't say the wise man spent twice as much as the foolish man or that the foolish man built his out of, out of wood and this guy built it out of, out of stone. It, it doesn't say anything like that. He's giving us the impression that everything looks the same. Everything looks similar. From the outside, the houses look equally strong. The problem isn't obvious on the outside. It's an issue of the foundation. What we're building can look very similar to what others are building, even people who don't know Jesus, who live a good life. But the difference is in the foundation. I've been listening to a book on tape uh, on my Audible app uh, for the last several weeks, and I've, I've loved this book. It's a biography uh, on uh, Captain James Cook, who his adventures, his three major uh, adventures in his uh, his taking the ship and just leaving England and going and looking for Antarctica and the islands of the, of the South Pacific. It's, just an, it's an amazing story. And the, the book is called Farther Than Any Man, The Rise and Fall of Captain James Cook. And I love how the author, Martin Dugard, uh, through Cook's own journal, shows that on his first voyage, he was a very humble man, very thoughtful and, and he was very successful. And he came back and there was some notoriety in, in London. He was gone for three years, comes back and he's home for about a year. And then he goes on a second voyage. And, and in his own journals, he's beginning to believe the press about him, what a great man he is and, and how he handles his crew and how he handles things adjusts a little bit. He again has gone four years that time. And on the third voyage he takes, his journals, he, even, he doesn't even prepare the ship properly because he, he believes even if the the ship has some faults to it and how it's been built in port there or rebuilt that, you know, I'm such a great captain, it'll be okay. And if you looked at him from the outside and just read the voyages or saw the voyages in that time and you were someone who, who read the press when he returned home, you'd think everything was the same about every one of his voyages. But in his third voyage, there's so much arrogance and he's so focused on himself. He's forgotten his wife and his kids. He's forgotten the bigger picture of what he was doing in his voyages that when he is in Hawaii, he discovers the Hawaiian Islands and as he interacts with those people, they kill him. It never makes it home. And those who had journals on the ship say that who had been with him in all three voyages said that would have never happened if he had the same attitude toward those people that he had toward island people they met in the first journey. You see, things can look the same on the outside, but we can be building our lives on the wrong foundation. Number three, storms will eventually come and test what we have built. Storms will eventually come and test what we have built. Jesus says the rain comes, the creeks and the streams rise, the wind blows. You see, it is not an issue of if storms will come, but when. Maybe it's going to be this afternoon. Maybe it's going to be this week. Maybe it's next month. Maybe it's 10 years from now. Storms come in all shapes and sizes. Job loss, a bad diagnosis, cancer, broken relationships, marriage, financial crisis, addiction. You know, we, we all face that there could be that dreaded call that comes, right? Last October, Leslie and I were at home alone. I think we were just watching TV about 10, 15 at night. Got a call 
picked it up. The guy on the other end says, hey, I'm the manager at uh, such and such climbing gym and, and your boy has fallen pretty hard. He's talking. He can move a little bit, but we're not letting him move till the ambulance comes. It's pretty serious. You need to meet the ambulance at the emergency room at Los Robles Hospital. Huh, we weren't planning for that incident. We weren't planning for that call. And the, the conversation we had on the way to the, the hospital, as I had, it was kind of quiet. We didn't know what to say. We said a few things. We'll trust God. We prayed. But there's a lot of uncertainty. And then to come to find out he, he needed back surgery. He now has two 10-inch titanium rods in his back, 10 4-inch screws. It's all fused to his body. They say they can actually take all the titanium out now because his own skeletal structure is back and strong. Uh, but you don't want to open him up for fear of infection to take all that metal out. He's doing very well. He's about 90% uh, back to where he was. Thank you for your prayers. Um, and he got better faster than we expected, way faster than the doctors or rehab said. But, but I don't like those kind of calls. And I just, I know the reality is more of them are going to come. You're saying, well, wow. Thanks for this warm discussion today in the service about how anytime. But let's just be real. Storms come. We're not immune from them. Number four, storms will relentlessly hit us from every angle. Storms will relentlessly hit us from every angle. Look at angle. Look at this in verse 25. The rain came down. The streams rose up. The winds blew and beat against the sides of the house. He says that about the wise man's house. And then he says it about the foolish man's house. The rain came down. Verse 27, the streams rose up and the winds blew and beat against that house. You ever go through a season like that? Where you're already facing one difficulty, one struggle, one challenge, and another one comes? You feel like you're getting it from above, from the sides, it's coming up because the rain is coming down, the floods are rising, the wind is blowing on the sides. There may be some of you who are right now in that season. Think of the Old Testament character Job. Very successful. Things are going great. He has a wonderful family. He has a wonderful wealth. He's got all kinds of success in livestock. And if you remember in Job chapter 1, a messenger comes in and says, Oh, your children have all been wiped out and killed in this freak accident. And the, the text says, while that servant was speaking, another servant comes in and says, Oh, Job, by the way, this half of your livestock and your, your portfolio basically was wiped out over here. And the text says, while he was still speaking, another servant came in. Four times it says, while the messenger with bad news was speaking, another messenger with bad news came. You ever been in one of those kind of situations? That's when the storm is relentless. Let me tell you, if you haven't built your life in a relationship with Jesus Christ and walking in obedience to him, things will go splat. Number five, any life built on the wrong foundation collapses completely when the storms rage against it. If your life is built on the wrong foundation, if you're building on the sand of just Christian ideas, Christian doctrine, Christian teachings, Christian concepts of being a good person, of your own career, being as good at that as you can be, or having the best family, whatever you're building your life on that's distracting you from your relationship with Jesus Christ and walking in obedience to him, then you're going to collapse when the storms rage against. I, I, I watch people who suffer the loss of a job or their home is foreclosed on or they, they go through death who don't know Jesus. And I wonder how they make it. I, I've watched people who don't know Jesus at a funeral and, and it's such a hopelessness. You say, well, but we have tears when we're going through difficulties. Yeah, there are tears. There's genuine pain. There's sorrow that we feel. But even with the death of someone we, we know and that person knew Jesus, Paul says we sorrow. Yeah, we have sorrow and tears like those who don't know the Lord. But we do that with the undergirding of hope. It's radically different. I ache for those who don't know Jesus and try to, they try to bear up under the storms of this life. Sixth, any life built on the solid rock of obedience to Christ stands successfully through, through the worst storms imaginable. 
Have you known people in your life who are followers of Christ and you look at them and man, storm after storm, the worst storm, storms that are hard to even imagine could happen to someone, keep happening to that person and, and they keep walking with Christ and yes, they cry and yes, they go through pain, but they keep giving glory to the Lord and they stand strong with that storm because they're, they're building their life on Jesus Christ and following his words. Last week, uh, you all uh, acknowledged my 10 years as senior pastor here, and thank you very much for that. And, and a number of you have emailed me or stopped me and, and spoken words of appreciation. Thank you. One of the greatest joys of these 10 years has been for me, early on, I met a dear brother who's now with Jesus, a Ugandan pastor named Bethuel Dongo, who Calvary's had a relationship with for a couple of decades, with he and Florence, his wife, and their family. And I, I got to know Pastor Dongo and found ourselves to be kindred spirits and got to go to Uganda. And we, we, he and I were in the front of a little van he was driving. And I noticed, uh, I'd noticed it before, but decided to ask that he was missing four fingers, three almost completely gone, and then one the tip on his left hand. And, and I asked him, you know, can, can you tell me what happened? What, what happened to your fingers? And, and um, I'd already asked him when I first met him about Idi Amin, because we as Americans, if you grew up in the 70s, you know, we were kind of obsessed with this dictator of Uganda. There were all these rumors that he would kill his enemies and he'd eat them and serve them at banquets and things like that. It was a horrible. And Saturday Night Live made all kinds of skits around, you know, Idi Amin. And so we as Americans think that's the worst of the worst. And so I remember asking him, you know, oh, how did you survive the years of Idi Amin? And and uh, on this occasion, when I asked him about his fingers, he said, you know how you guys are obsessed with Idi Amin? I said, yeah, and he was such a terrible man. He said, he was nothing compared to the nine years of civil war that followed him. We couldn't buy salt. You couldn't buy flour. People starved to death. All these tribes were warring in the vacuum of, of no leader. He, he said that the military groups of these various uh, factions that were fighting took and destroyed all the animals, all the, all the wildlife. So you can't go on safari in Uganda anymore because they wiped out whole groups of animals in trying to survive. And these groups of, of soldiers would roam around and steal from people in villages and on, in some of the slums of Kampala. And he said there was a time during the harshest time of that when it would, there was no electricity at certain times of day, at night even, where he and Florence uh, feared for their lives because soldiers would come through. And they'd only been married less than a year. And they were still enjoying that honeymoon phase, committed to serving Jesus as, as servants of his in ministry. And uh, a group of soldiers came to their house, came in with machine guns, and forced them to begin to take their dishes and their silverware and put them in boxes because these soldiers were going to sell these things and make money. Now here, when someone gets married, you know, we go to Neiman Marcus or somewhere and we get the, the bridal registry and you can, you know, so you can go and buy two uh, sets of, of uh, dishes that'll match up with somebody else buying these two and somebody these glasses and these little serving plates and it can all be coordinated and it can happen with that wonderful, uh, you know, bridal registry that you can do at uh, department stores and other stores. That's not how it is in the developing world. There is a tradition in Uganda and other places like that where at the wedding, everybody brings, every family brings like one plate or one fork and all the friends and family bring these pieces together and the couple is given this stuff to get started. Nothing matches, but they celebrate the love and even the sacrifice of others to give that stuff to them. And what these soldiers were forcing Florence and Dongo to do was they were forcing them to put all that stuff in boxes and they were going to take it with them. And they knew this plate came from this aunt and this, this uh, glass came from this neighbor. And there was a lot of emotion and senti sentimental value to these things. And the soldiers had all the boxes and were beginning to leave. Guns on, aimed at, at Dongo and Florence. They told Florence to stay in the back room of this little two-room building they lived in. And they had Dongo walk out. They closed the door to the back room and they told him, when, when we walk out the front door, you latch that front door and lock it behind us. You stay in there. So he goes, they walk out, he closes the door, and as he's bringing the door to a close, he hears the Lord say, jump away from the door. 
And as he brings the, the, the door to a close, as he pushes it close, he jumps back into the corner away from the door itself. Well, the soldiers told him to do what they told him to do because they took their machine guns and riddled up and down the door, believing he was right behind it as the door was closing to kill him. But he moved out of the way, but his hand was still in the door and they shot off his fingers. I said, how did that feel? He said, how do you think that felt? He said, it was like someone lit fire to every one of my fingers. It was just shot off. Pitch black, dark, no electricity. His wife heard that, believed they had killed him, and Florence starts screaming from the back room. Are you okay? Can you hear me? Uh, Bethul, speak to me. Say something. And she's screaming out. But he knows if he responds to her, the soldiers are probably still out there waiting to see if he's dead. And if he responds to her and reassures her and she quiets down, then they'll just come back in and kill him. So he allows his wife to scream for 15 to 20 minutes. The soldiers do believe her screams are the sign that he's dead and they move on. So finally, he goes to her and reassures her, tells her to stay back there. He goes to the neighbor who was a drunk man he couldn't trust for anything, but he's the only guy he could find to help him get to the hospital in Kapala. With the lights out and the way it was from that slum to where they needed to go, it took them about two hours to go through the darkness of night. He's bleeding, they get to the hospital, there's one doctor there, but they have no gauze, they have nothing they can do. The doctor uses part of his own shirt to wrap the fingers. And at that point, Florence was pregnant and they found out soon after that that she was expecting during that time. And so when that little baby girl was born, they named that baby Victory that God had given them the victory that day. And when that little baby got to be three, she suffered from something that is rarely known in the modern world. She suffered from measles. And the measles took that little girl's life. And when Dongo told me this story and he shared all this with me, and I knew the rest of the story that he'd sacrificed so much at times they had dozens of kids living in their home and then he started the God Care School and he'd been through so much. I remember riding along in that van, talking to him. I just looked at him and said, you are such a strong man of faith. I don't know if I could go through all those unimaginable storms and be strong in that. And if you knew Dongo, he had this way of dismissing something or kind of saying, oh, that doesn't matter. He would go, Psh. And so as I'm saying, you know, I just admire you, your faith, what you've gone through in your life. and You keep serving Jesus through all of it. And he went, Psh. Would you be ready if a storm came that was unimaginable because of your walk of obedience with Jesus Christ, would your life still stand on the rock? Or are you trusting in the success of your career, or the success of your family, or the success of your stuff, or the success of, of just your Christianity in general, the image? Number seven, building on any foundation other than obedience to Christ risks everything for the sake of short-sighted expediency and personal agendas. You know, when we try to do it our way, when we try to rest in our own success and build our own foundation, we often do that just because it's the expedient way to do it. We've got other agendas other than the agenda of Christ. All those other things are not bad things, but they need to fall in line to the Lordship of Jesus Christ. Number eight, genuinely successful lives are being built by being dug down deep, dug down deep in the bedrock of obediently following Jesus. Dug down deep, deep footers. You see, the, Jesus doesn't in Matthew 7 describe exactly how they built and the, the house he's describing built in the rock, it's not just like he built it on the flat rock and that was it. As a matter of fact, he expands on this in Luke's version of the story and recording Jesus. Luke goes a little further and, and fills in more of the words that Jesus said. In Luke 6.48, it says about the wise man who dug down deep and laid the foundation on the rock. The foolish man who built his house on the sand just put it on the sand. But the wise man who built on the rock, he dug footers. I grew up about an hour and a half to two hours from Chicago. And the big thing, in, one of the big things besides the Cubs and stuff like that in Chicago was the Sears Tower when I was a kid, now called the Willis Tower. Tallest building in the world up until about 15 or 20 years ago. Still the tallest building in the United States. You can go and stand on a glass platform where you stand out and you're looking down and it's scary. 
the footers, the concrete footers and metal rebar for the size of that are 100 feet underground, dug down deep. When I started seminary and Les and I got married, my in-law said, you can live here a few months. We're going to build this house on this other lot we have. And so he started, my father-in-law went and got a general contractor's license so that he could oversee the plumbing, the electric, the framing, the roofing, everything, which you can imagine what that's like if he ignores warning lights on his car. <laughs> he had someone come and dig the basic uh, basement area. But then he said to me, we're going to dig the footers down even further. And he said, when this house is done, then you and Leslie can live in this house until you complete seminary. And then you can go wherever God takes you and we'll either sell it, move into it, rent it, whatever. He said, but help me with this. So we took a few days where we dug the footers and then we put the rebar in and then he had someone come and pour the concrete. And then we took and we took the tar around the base of the block of the basement and down around, we put a French drain. So we were preparing based on what uh, the state of Maryland, Prince George's County, and the city of Laurel, Maryland, all said needed to be done for that kind of soil in that location so that you would be prepared for the hundred year floods and for the storms. He had to put some pumps in and all kinds of stuff. I watched firsthand what it meant to be dug down deep. I kept those blue jeans for a very long time to be my, my trophy of my hard work because all the tar that was all over my pants and I've never done anything like that ever again, and you don't want me building any foundations to anything physical when it comes to a physical structure. But I learned what it meant to be dug down deep, intentionally prepared for the storms that will eventually come. Genuinely successful lives are being built by being dug down deep in the bedrock of obediently following Jesus. Are you digging down deep? You're building your life on the sand, all the other stuff and success of life and even the success of Christianity. If you are, when the storms come, your life will go splat. But if you're building your life on the words of Christ and following in obedience to the words of Christ in his word today, then your life, even though there'll be tears and there'll be struggle, your life will stand firm when the storms come and the winds blow, the floods rise, the rain falls. Let me ask you, are you building your life wisely on Jesus and in your obedient walk with him? Or are you building your life foolishly on all the other stuff that can distract us from what we're called to as the followers of Jesus? The first two parts of that song dealt with the wise men and the foolish men. The last part is, build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ. Build your life on the Lord Jesus Christ and the blessings will come down. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. The blessings will come down as the prayers go up. So build your life on the Lord. Father, help us in a world that can give us so many great opportunities and, and, and success, and help us not to build our lives on anything other than Jesus Christ, the solid rock. And not just in the concept or celebrating his words, but in building our lives in obediently following what Jesus tells us, submitting to him as Lord. And Lord, I pray that if there's someone here who recognizes today the Spirit has shown them they're building their life on the wrong thing, may today they confess that, tear down that idol, and focus on following Jesus and obeying his word. I pray for those who have been building their lives. They've been digging down deep into the foundation of Jesus. May you reassure them that when the storm comes, they prepared properly. Father, help us to heed the warning that building on anything other than Jesus Christ leads to complete collapse and ruin. Help us to share that with our children, with the, the middle school and high school students in our homes. Lord, we want you to receive all the honor and the glory because our lives are firmly built on your son. In Jesus' name we pray, amen.